Thank you, Carol. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Be assured that each worshiper is welcome here in God's home and let us worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Good morning. Good morning, Patty. Um, with the news of the church, um, there will be a deacon's meeting um, at 5.30 this Tuesday. And if anyone has any college student addresses or anyone that might need a care package, uh, please let the office know or you can uh, let me know. Uh, there's um, a P PW meeting uh, this Wednesday at 10 o'clock here in the Fellowship Hall. And also there is a memorial service for Bob Wolford Friday, September 17th. And Friday, September 17th, there is also a food drive from 11 to 5 at the fairway for um, the mission. And also Saturday, September 18th, from 9 to 3 at High B. And September 26th is our first day of Sunday school here during worship. Mm -hmm. So that's a celebration to get those little kids in here with their cute little voices and smiles. Amen. Um, also, I have a personal um, message out there. Um, during ShanFest, that is around the 24th, 25th of September, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, in the celebration of 150 years, I am um, opening up um, and celebrate in Stern Studio in uh, Shenandoah with um, all the photographs are going to be brought out um, and everyone to um, look through and uh, reminisce and um, take what would they like. It's theirs. Um, it's they're just going to be displayed out for that weekend and um, with the history of the church and everyone involved with uh, Stern Studio, I thought that um, you all need to know that. But there will be, uh, if you would like to give a donation to revise Shenandoah, um, that is what the offering is going to at that time. So this will be down at the Stern Studio, Serenity Studio, and um, it will be, it is right behind the new hotel. There is plenty of photographs and negatives, and um, there is a card catalog. So after that, these, uh, all these pictures, which is sad, but they are, are going to be destroyed. So. All righty. Um, please join me in the responsive call to worship. Um, we're going to do the gathering song, Lord, Prepare Me. Uh, number 701. Friends, I'm going to play through this once so that you have an understanding. Of, uh, we've done it before, but a, a refresher, and then I'll invite you to join together, and we'll sing it a couple of times. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living
now please join me in the responsive call to worship. Look at the heavens, and they are shouting the glory of God. The days and nights declare the magnificent of God's creative words, works. The earth and their words reach to the ends of the world. Let our words and praise be acceptable to you. Our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer, we praise and worship you. The hymn for this morning, When Morning Glides the Skies, number 6667. Call to confession. Let us use our voices to declare those things that we have said and done that have separated us from God and from each other, that we may experience God's mercy and receive God's forgiveness. Let us pray. You have, you have called, called us, O oh God, and, and we, we have, have refused to listen. listen. You have stretched out your hand, and we have not taken it. We have taken what you have given us, and used those gifts to hurt others and defy you. We have refused to be tamed by your wisdom. Forgive our inability to recognize you and live out the reality of your gospel. Give us the insight we need to understand your place in our lives so that our words and actions reflect the glory of God in the lives of others. In the name of the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the responsive assurance of God's grace. The law of the Lord is perfect, and it revives the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, and make wise the simple. The precept of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, and they enlighten the eyes. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, the living word, we are forgiven. Good friends, I invite you to join your hearts and minds and spirits together with me in a word of prayer.
Holy and gracious God, by the power of your Spirit, open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and our ears to hear, receive, and accept your word for us this day. May the risen Jesus Christ, who is with us and for us, continue to guide us into your truth and continue to form and shape our lives into your will. We ask this and pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And welcome to all of you who are a part of our worship service online, wherever you are and however you are. We're glad that you have joined us in this time of, of sacred space, sacred uh, being, and in the presence of God. Welcome to worship. Our Bible passage this morning, friends, is taken from the Gospel of Mark, the 27th, the 8th chapter, starting at the 27th verse and going to verse 38. There are, in the Gospel of Mark, 16 chapters, which means that this particular passage comes at the midpoint of Mark's Gospel, and there is a reason for that. It's because this particular passage in the Gospel of Mark serves as a turning point. Prior to this passage, the identity of Jesus has sort of been kind of up in the air. Different people saying different things about who he is and what he's up to and why he showed up in the first place. Following this, Jesus makes it more clear to his disciples and to those who continue to follow him what he's up to, who he is and how that will change their lives and the life of the world. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, mm, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about them. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for the for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. I may have told you before that it took me 10 years 
to get my undergraduate college degree. The reason that it took 10 years was, you know, probably in part because I'm not the brightest bulb in the pack, but also because I was what you would refer to these days as a non-traditional student. I started college and then I took some time off to be married and to work and then went back to college but worked full time during the day and took classes at night as I could. That meant that it took about 10 years to get that undergraduate degree. And I was the first one in my family of origin to graduate from college. My dad would have been great in college. He's one smart cookie. Probably would have been an engineer or a astrophysicist or something like that. He's smart enough for that, but he had to quit school and help support his family. He would have been great. As it was, it took me about 10 years, and I went to a place called Bellevue College. It was Bellevue College back then. It's Bellevue University now, and about 10 years ago, they, they sent me a letter that said if I wanted to have my diploma changed to read Bellevue University, that they would gladly do that for $25. To which I said, well, I'll have to find it first. I don't know where it is. And back when I was going to Bellevue College, the Hinky Dinky grocery store that was across the street from the college was actually bigger than the campus of the college itself. So we went to a place that they lovingly had nicknamed Hinky Dinky High. Some of the buildings that were there for classrooms were used Quonset huts from the Air Force. Oh. But there was something else. Across the street and up the hill from the library of Bellevue College, where I often spent a lot of my time because I was working full time, I went straight from work to the college, and because I was there before classes, I went to the library to do whatever I needed to do. So I spent a lot of time in the library, and, and you could see through the windows of the library, across the street and up the hill, there was a church. I do not know what denomination that church is. I never stepped foot in that church. But that church made a huge difference for me throughout that entire process because on the outside of their building, they had a large illuminated cross that you could see all over that neighborhood and from any point where you were on campus. Now here's why that was important to me, because I had gone back to school after receiving what I took to be a calling. I've also told you before that it was not my idea to be a minister. And so all of those nights in all of those classes, sitting there in the library, that cross on that church served as a beacon. It served as a reminder to me when those days were long and when I was in the middle of it and it was frustrating and it didn't feel like we were making any progress, that cross served as a beacon, as a reminder of why I was doing what I was doing because it wasn't my idea. It had been handed to me, if you will. 
that experience of going back to school, those 10 long years, took place under the light of the cross. Took place, if you will, in the way of that cross. Crosses take all kinds of shapes and sizes, don't they? Do you, do you have a, a cross? Maybe on, on a piece of jewelry? A cross that's in your home? A cross that you somehow wear? Or is a part of your daily life? Crosses have become almost kind of commonplace, haven't they? So that, so that they're, they kind of blend into the scenery, they kind of blend into the landscape so that you can see one and not really even notice it or ponder it or imagine how that cross is shaping your life in ways that are meant to make a difference. Uh, I did a little quick tour of the sanctuary this morning. Quick, by the way. So, you know, a part of what you're paying me for is to wander around the sanctuary when you're not here, trying to count crosses. I counted 25 crosses here in the sanctuary. I'll let you pick them out later on as the sermon gets more boring. 25 crosses, and, and friends, that doesn't even count all the crosses that are on all the hymnals in the pews. Now, when you add those in, we're probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 or 80 crosses, right? here in the sanctuary that inhabit the space that we do, that we sometimes take for granted. The, like we look through them as if they aren't even there. But according to Jesus, those crosses are to determine the shape of our lives. Those crosses are to determine the purpose and direction of our lives. Those crosses are to determine who we are, our identity, our basic identity, just as it did for him. Mark tells us that Jesus explained this part to his disciples plainly. So, for a change, I'd like to make a part of the sermon plain. If you are a Christian, if that is how you identify yourself in any way, shape, or form, if you are a Christian, what that means is that you are a follower of of Jesus, that somehow with your life you are trying by the grace of God in your life to follow Jesus. The church is a center for followers. And if you are a follower of Jesus, let me make this as clear as I can. A cross is standard issue. If you are a follower of Jesus, you receive a cross of some shape, of some size, that is specially fit for you. Those are non-negotiable parts of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Our lives, our activity, who we are, take place 
under the light of the cross and in the way of the cross. Which means this. That if you follow Jesus, there will come a time when you are asked to love in a costly way. There will come a time when you are asked out of love to sacrifice something of yourself for someone else's good. When it would probably be so much easier not to. But that's what it means to be a Christian or to follow. That's what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples and to the crowd that was following, any of you that want to be my take up your cross and follow in my way. That is a gift and a blessing, and it is a challenge all in one. Because in our culture, in the water that we swim in, and in the air that we breathe in our culture, we are trained to follow winners. We are trained to want to follow and emulate people who are successful. We are not trained to follow and emulate people who are crucified. Or for all practical intents and purposes, lost. When it looked like the world won and God lost. When it looked like the world was successful and God was defeated because Jesus lived his life in love for others in ways that were costly. And he chose that because He was convinced that not only was it God's way, but it was God's will for his life, and that in doing that, he received a life he never could have had otherwise. And that part is true for us as well. In following Jesus, we are given a life that is far more meaningful than any life we can try to fashion apart from him. It was confusing for his disciples. It was confusing for the crowd. And there are days, my friends, when it is certainly confusing for us to live in this paradox of cruciform space and a cruciform life. That is what it means to be a Christian. We follow him. We deny ourselves. We are given a cross. And that cross is the love that makes a difference for someone else and makes the world a better place. It is a part of God's design for all creation. There was a young man who took Jesus up on this invitation to follow. And evidently, nobody warned him ahead of time, or at least didn't warn him sufficiently that it might cost him something. He was a star lacrosse player for his school, and 
on spring break, he chose to accompany his church to Haiti to partner with Habitat for Humanity in building homes there over spring break. But that was in the middle of lacrosse season. So he missed a couple of practices and, and knew that what that meant was that he was going to have to sit out a couple of games when he got back. Which was the usual practice for missing time. And he was willing to accept that. Unfortunately, his coach never read the chapter titled, He Was Crucified. The part about taking up your cross and following, because in front of all of his teammates, the coach said that his decision to go on that habitat hap trip, habitat trip, made it clear that he was a loser. When the team lost both games that he was forced to miss, the coach was quoted in the school paper as saying that the only reason they lost the games is because the young man didn't play. He put his own interests above the team's interest. What do you think? Loser? Selfish, putting his own interests above the interest of the team? It cost him quite a bit. Where can we got, find a good center for followership? Our dedication to Jesus and the crosses he gives us to carry alongside him tell the world who he is and who we are and what real life is meant to look like. And on this anniversary of a time that was so tragic in the life of our nation, on this anniversary of a, of a day of deep pain and of great wounds, and of deep loss. This is also an anniversary of a reminder of those who did set themselves aside for someone else's good, for someone else's life, when out of a sense of duty or, or love or identity of who they were, they went straight into harm's way to try to save somebody else, whether it cost them their lives or not. Which actually turns out to be the shape of the cross. <coughs> and that's how we live it, <clears throat> in a kind of a daily way by giving of ourselves in love. Theologian Fred Craddock put it this way, we think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a thousand dollar bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord, I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that he sends us to the bank and has us cash in the thousand dollars for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents there. Usually giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done in all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. Jesus said, if anyone would follow after me, let them take up their cross and follow me. Standard issue, every day, it's who we are. Thanks be to God.
<clears throat> Friends, our hymn in response to hearing God's word is the summons. Friends, please join your hearts and minds and spirits together with me in a time of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come before you this day with thanksgiving for the very precious gift of life and for all the ways that you give us for making that life worth living. Help us, God, to not take too much for granted in the course of our days. Help us to live with a deeper awareness that you continue to bless us and gift us each and every day in, in hundreds of ways. We give you thanksgiving for the beauty of the earth and for the changing of seasons and for the ripening of what has been sown and for the promise of harvest. We give you thanksgiving for the seeds that are sown in lives, in schools, by teachers, in homes, by loving parents and grandparents in churches where the seed is scattered by a good sower. For the way these things grow in us and then bear fruit for others. Such is your way, and we give you thanks. We pray for teachers and students as school unfolds. 
We pray for the ministry and the life of the church as our service unfolds for the life of the world. Help us to not be concerned with survival. Help us not to be concerned with outward signs of some success that someone else determines, but to rather imagine our crosses as being life-giving, as imagining our life together as being a, a channel of your grace and life for the world. May you continue to make your church church faithful in every place. We pray for other faiths, God, and for those of goodwill and good faith who are partners with us on this journey. Help us all, God, to learn respect, to see the giftedness and to share in the calling. On this day, God, when we are reminded of loss and of grief, we pray for those who have lost loved ones and who are grieving. We pray for those whose lives were changed 20 years ago in ways that are still having an impact. We pray on our, for our corporate life together, for the ways that things are still having an impact. But remind us, God, also of lessons learned when we pull together. Lessons learned when we invest in the common good with who we are. When we see each other not as rivals in a political party or as, as rivals for, for some ideology, but as opportunity so that this land can become good for all. We pray, God, for those who are in care centers for those who are in hospitals, and for those who attend them, and for their families. Holy and gracious God, for each of us and for all of us, strengthen our desire to follow Jesus into a life that is worth living. For we would ask these things and pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our response to God's grace and God's goodness, God's initiative in all of life is to share, to offer thanks, and to respond to God as God gives opportunities for us to be a channel of blessing and grace for others. In response to, in response to the gifts and what we brought with us to share with God today, I invite you to join with me in a prayer that dedicates those gifts to God's glory and God's purpose. Let us pray. God of wisdom, may this offering serve as a powerful witness to this world in need. Guide us as we administer the gifts that you have given us 
from the building of your kingdom. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn, friends, is Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Friends, I invite you to join together in our response of benediction found in the bulletin. May God, our wisdom, pour out God's thoughts on us and in us, and make God's word known to us. May Jesus Christ, our Messiah, give us the strength to carry our cross and to follow him. And may God's Holy Spirit, our tongue of fire, guide our words and actions as we strive to bless the world with our witness. And the people of God said, Alleluia.